Lux Radio Theater brings you Claudette Colbert and Ray Milan in Practically Yours. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. John Cromwell. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. With our marquee lights ablaze, our theater crowded, welcome to another night, opening night at the Lux Radio Theater. Not in Hollywood alone, but clear across the continent, from city homes to lonely country farms, and to our men and women overseas, the curtain rises on our 12th season on the air. And tonight, it rises strictly on laughter, upon a rollicking farce with two of your favorite Hollywood players. Claudette Colbert in her original scre screen role, and Ray Milan. Supported by an all-star cast, they appear in Practically Yours from Paramount Studios, who are currently celebrating a third of a century of public entertainment. And I know of no more hilarious sample of that entertainment than tonight's story of a returning hero, who finds himself caught between a fiancé he hardly knows, a jealously obnoxious rival, and a dog. Just how important a wire-haired terrier can be in human destiny, you'll sh shortly learn. In a world still suffering from the shock of war and faced with difficult problems of recovery, this national theater can, I believe, do much to cheer our hearts and rest our minds with laughter, excitement, and suspense. That will be our goal throughout the coming season. With, we hope, your earnest criticism and advice. For you, as we have often said, are the real sponsors of this theater. You and Lux. Your loyalty has been a challenge to us to present the best that we can find in stars and plays. We sincerely trust that your friendship to this theater, like your preference for Lux toilet soap, will be rewarded by continued satisfaction. Now, as tens of millions thrill to the theater's greatest annual opening, our curtain rises on act one of practically yours with Claudette Colbert as Peggy and Ray Milland as Lieutenant Bellamy. A modest apartment in midtown New York City. In the combination bedroom and living room, two girls talk quietly. On a table are day's newspapers, their blaring headlines proclaiming the heroism of a young Navy flyer. One of the girls looks at her watch and then at the radio. It's almost 8 o'clock. You know, Peggy, I bet everybody in the Prudential Typewriter Company is doing just what we're doing right now, waiting for that radio program. The whole country will be listening. A lot of good it'll do him now. Dan Bellamy, out there in the middle of the Pacific, dead, blown to pieces. I think he used to work with us, Grace. Right there in accounts receivable. Peggy. Hmm? Peggy, were you in love with Dan? It's 8 o'clock. You better turn on the radio. Yeah. Were you in love with him, Peggy? How could I have been in love with him? He hardly even looked at me. But you went for him, didn't you? What girl didn't go for him? Oh, it doesn't seem right talking about him like this. Not, not now. Oh, nearly three years ago. But well, the program's on already. We've been missing it. Oh, that darn clock of ours. And now Lieutenant Bellamy is dead. Single-handed, this intrepid young flyer sent a Japanese carrier to the bottom of the Pacific, as we all know. But what we didn't know is that the last words of this hero were recorded for all posterity. Words that you will hear shortly. To tell you more about this, here is United States Senator James L. Cowie. Senator Cowie? Gosh! Two days ago, Lieutenant Daniel Bellamy thanked the Japanese carrier Kyushu by deliberately diving his plane into the enemy ship. A few seconds before meeting his death, Lieutenant Bellamy was in radio contact with another Navy plane. His conversation with this plane was picked up and recorded by a Navy monitor. You will now hear a copy of that recording, the last words of an American hero. Fellow Americans, will you join me, please, in rising? Can you hear me, Adams? Adams, can you hear me? That's Dan's boy. He's talking to that other plane. I hear you, Bellamy. Remember, you don't have a bomb sight. Just keep circling, and when you're sure you've got it, drop those demolitions. Don't worry, I won't miss. You know, I've heard of guys doing something like this. I always wondered how they made up their minds. 
Nobody wants to go, but when a chance like this comes along, it's just too big a bargain to pass up. That's why I'm going into a dive, Adam. Don't be crazy, Bellamy. You'll never be able to pull out of it. You've got two demolitions. Drop them and get out of there. There's only one way to get that baby for sure, Adams. I've got to dive. I think I'll start about 8,000. That's a nice round number. You know what you're doing, fella? I know. I wonder where I'd rather be right now than here. <laughs> you laugh, Adams, but I can't think of any better place than a Prudential typewriter company sitting at my old desk, a third one from the end. Yeah, I wish I could do that just once more. And one more look at Piggy. I wish I could walk with her through Central Park and kiss the tip of her nose. Well, this is it. 8,000 feet. Okay, Tojo, my compliments to the Emperor of Japan. Damn. Damn, Peggy. I can't listen anymore. Turn it off, Chris. Turn it off. Oh, sure, honey. Turn it off. Oh, Dan. <laughs> Sure, you don't want a doctor, Peggy. How do you feel? I'm perfectly all right. I hadn't fainted since I was a kid. Better lie down, dear. Grace, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what Dan said on the radio? Oh, Peggy. He wanted to look at me once more. He wanted to walk with me in Central Park. And... Oh, Peggy, I just don't know what to say. I never knew Dan loved me. I never imagined he loved me. Peggy. Mr. Meglin's coming to see you. Do you remember how we used to go to lunch? But there were four or five of us. Sometimes Dan would come along, and he'd sit near me sometimes, but he never said anything special. Not that I can remember. Oh, let me say something. Peggy, did you hear what I said? He's coming here right away. Mr. Meglin, the president of the company. He just telephoned. He heard it on the radio. Oh, that, that's very nice of him. Oh, Dad, why didn't you tell me? And so I just wanted you to know how sorry I am, Miss uh, uh, Peggy, and at the same time how I share the tremendous pride you must feel. Thank you, Mr. Meglin. Well, I'll, I'll be running along. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, there's a big bond drive on the radio tomorrow night, and they'd like you to say a few words. And after all, as Dan Bellamy's talk, sweetheart... Talk on the I, radio. Oh, they'll furnish the speech, of course. Uh, but if you'd rather not... Oh, no, I'd be glad to do it if you think it would do any good. Oh, that's very noble of you. Oh, uh, don't think of coming to work tomorrow. Oh, Mr. Meglin, we're so far behind. Oh, uh, nonsense. Save your strength for the broadcast. Oh, uh, uh, the newsreel people also called. And after the broadcast, they'd like to get a little something for the newsreels. Yes, I, I see. Now, 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 don't worry. I'll stop by here tomorrow and we'll work out everything. I'll do my best, Mr. Meglin. Thank you. Fellow women of the radio audience, I say draw on the strength that is within you, the moral strength women have had to develop through the ages. We also serve who only stand and wait. So wait and pray and work. For no matter how small is your contribution to the war effort, it's bound to help end this terrible war sooner. And maybe one woman somewhere will have the man she loves in her arms again, the man she otherwise might have lost forever. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, when you hear such stirring thoughts, it can remind you only of one thing. The war bonds of today... Oh, you were wonderful, Peggy. Wonderful. Aren't we going to stay for the rest of the program, Mr. Oh, Meglin? Uh, those newsreel people, my dear. Remember? Oh, that's right. Uh, they're in the publicity office. Uh, this way, Peggy. Miss Martin, you just face the camera and start talking. You can just say the same thing you just now said on the radio. Yes. <laughs> to you women whose men are fighting in the service of our uh, No, no, not yet, Miss Martin. I'll tell you when to begin. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant to Excuse start. Excuse me, Mr. Ellis in here? Uh, what is it? I just got a news flash on the teletype, Mr. Ellis. The newsroom told me to tell you right away. Tell me what? Lieutenant Bellamy has been found. He's alive. Alive? But what do you mean? Well, well it, it seems that when he hit that Jap carrier with his bombs, the force of the explosions threw his plane out of the dive. Anyway, he was picked up by a Navy patrol boat, and he's safe. Not even a scratch. I don't understand you. 
Oh, you're not all just saying this for some reason on account of the newsreel. What else did it say? What else? Hold on to your hat. They're flying Lieutenant Bellamy back home right now. He'll be back in New York tomorrow. Here? Tomorrow? Grab her, Mr. McGlynn. She's going to faint. Uh, I've, got, I've got her. No, no, no. Hold her like that. And start those cameras, Cal. Go on. Roll them. Oh, boy. Navy hero back from Pacific. Miracle man Dan Bellamy flying across country. Gigantic welcome for Bellamy at LaGuardia Airport. New York Thunder's welcome to returning heroes. Hello? Hello, I can't hear you, Mr. Neglin. Are you still at the airport? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear them cheering? How's Dan? How does he look? Oh, he's fine. I called to tell you that he might be delayed. What? Uh, delayed. There must be 50,000 people here. They won't let him go. Be sure to stay there with Mrs. Meglin, won't you? Oh, I will. I will. I I'm leaving now, but I've arranged everything with his uncle. Who? Dan's uncle. His uncle, Ben. His uncle's going to drive him to the house. Oh, will Dan be surprised when he sees you? So just you sit tight, and you'll have Dan Bellamy in your arms in just about 30 minutes. Goodbye. In my arms. In my arms in 30 minutes. Holy mackerel. Didn't think we'd ever get away. Why didn't you warn me, Uncle Ben? That's what happens when you're a hero, son. That's one word I never want to hear again. Hey, where are we going? It's a sort of a surprise, Dan. Your old boss wants to see you, Mr. Maglin. He does? Well, that's swell. Sure get a kick out of seeing the old office again. Except we're going to Mr. Maglin's house. I'm dropping you off there. Oh, uh, Dan, weren't you just a little disappointed that she wasn't at the airport? Who? Well, your girl, of course. Girl? Which girl? Now, son, don't try to fool your Uncle Ben. But I'd better tip you off. She's waiting for you at Mr. Meglin's house. Who's waiting for me at Mr. Meglin's house? Why, Peggy, of course. Your girl. Peggy. I haven't any girl named Peggy. Don't think? Ben, I heard you with my own ears. One more look at Peggy. I wish I could walk with her through Central Park, and I'd like to kiss the tip of her nose. Oh, Uncle Ben, somebody's made a mistake. I wasn't thinking about a girl. I was talking about Piggy. Piggy, my dog. Piggy? 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 Why, <laughs> sure. When I went away, I had to put Piggy in a kennel. I always wondered what would have happened to her if anything happened to me. Believe me, I spent more than one sleepless night worrying about Piggy. You did, huh? Look... Couldn't we go over to the kennels now? I, I'd sure like to see Piggy. You'd better go straight to the Meglins. Uh, but I'll pick up the dog and bring her on over. Would you like that? Would I? Here, I'll give you the address of the kennels. I've got the card here somewhere. Dan, you're sure it'll be all right? After all, that girl thinks... I'll that... explain what happened, and that's all that there'll be to it. Well, I guess if you can handle a Jap carrier, you can handle this. <laughs> Come to think of it, it's pretty funny. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> Welcome home. Come in, son. Come right in. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Meglin. Uh, Lieutenant Bellamy, meet to Mrs. Meglin. How do you do? My goodness, you're a big boy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Commander Harper, Lieutenant. Congratulations, Bellamy. Thank you, sir. Uh, you see, Dan, we're not making typewriters anymore. No, sir. Everything is for the war effort. Commander Harper sees to it that we turn it out fast enough. You can relax, Lieutenant. Your ex-boss and I are very old friends. And now, Lieutenant, if you'll close your eyes. Close my eyes. Uh, that's it. Come in, Peggy. Here he is. Dan's home, my dear. <laughs> oh, Dan. Huh? You may open your eyes now. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, well, just don't stand there, Peggy. What he wants is a nice big kiss. Well, I wouldn't mind that at all, but... Uh, but well, uh... Peggy. Oh, Dan. Well, I... Didn't get anything like that at the airport. <laughs> Dan, you're well. You, you weren't hurt. Oh, I'm fine, uh, Peggy. Just look at them, Commander. All they can do is just stare at each other. Mr. and Mrs. Meglin <laughs> have been so wonderful, Dan. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Come inside, everybody. We'll have a nice talk before dinner. Now then, how long is your leave? Uh, they said I'd have two weeks, sir. Two whole weeks? Oh, Dan, that's wonderful. Well, son, you're going to live right here at this house. Oh, but Mr. Meglin, I... Harry, you're a commander. Command him. <laughs> well... I guess that's an order, Bellamy. But, Peggy, you're staying here, too. And uh, you're not going back to work until his leave is over. But we're awfully behind in accounts receivable. But don't you see what this all means, my dear? 
Thousands of women who haven't heard from their men folks for months can now feel hopeful. And if Dan can come through safely, why, anybody can. But look, I, I, I think it's time I said something to, to Peggy. And I, I dare say you have one or two things to tell him, hey, Peggy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't know where to begin. I, oh, I'm so happy I, I could cry. Look, Peggy, uh, could I talk to you alone for a minute? Of course. You see, I... I beg your pardon, Mr. Maitland. A uh, gentleman to see Lieutenant Bellamy. It's Uncle Ben. Well, have him come in. Uh, yes. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. I just got by with one of Dan's old friends. Go get him, girl. It's her. It's my dog. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. Say, you are glad to see me, aren't you? Come on, now. Give me a little kiss. That's it. Missed me a little, didn't you, huh? Well, Dan, oh, I knew you wanted to see Porky and... I knew Porky wanted to see you, so I brought Porky down here. Am I glad to see Porky? <laughs> I just love dogs. <laughs> Cute little things, isn't she, Peggy? <laughs> oh, a little excited, I guess. Uh, hasn't seen me in quite a while. <laughs> how do you think I feel? Oh, Uncle Ben, how about a drink, eh? I'd sure like one, but I've got to get home to Jersey. Well, Dan, can I drop you off somewhere? Uh, We've appropriated your nephew for the next two weeks, Uncle Ben. Huh? Yeah, yeah, you better run along, Uncle Ben. I'll get in touch with you later on. But, uh, oh, oh, dear. What about Porky? Uh, Porky's going to stay right here with his master. Aren't you, Mr. Porky? <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> well, I, uh, well, goodbye, everybody. Good luck, Dan. Thanks, Uncle Ben. You know, Mother, I just had an idea. I think Dan and Peggy ought to take him a good show tomorrow night. What did you say, Marvin? I said Dan and Peggy ought to take him a good show tomorrow night. Peggy? Oh, I think that would be fine. Uh, what show would you like, uh, Dan? Well, I'm afraid Dan hasn't had much time to keep up with the current theater, Marvin. Any ideas, Peggy? Oh, hello, Porky. Oh, good doggy. Down, down, Porky. <laughs> That's it. Well, it's really all up to Dan. Peggy, never give a man the right to make decisions. Oh, oh, hello, hello, Porky. No, 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 Porky. Not on my lap, please. Down, Porky. Down, down. Oh, stop licking Mr. Maglin, Porky. No, 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 Porky. No, no. Down, down. <laughs> uh, she's a friendly little thing, isn't she? <laughs> ah, no, no, lie down, Porky. That's better. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> uh, Mother, we've got to give those children a slap bang up wedding. Uh, cross swords and everything. Uh, what would you think of that, uh, Peggy? <laughs> well, I. Uh, that dog is certainly crazy about you, Mr. Magnus. <laughs> uh, yes, isn't she? <laughs> you know, all dogs are just crazy about me. <laughs> uh, about that show tomorrow night, uh, why don't we go to a musical comedy, Peggy? We have fun with me, but about your wedding. Now, two weeks is a very short time to arrange for such a big affair. Well, you know, that reminds me. Uh, one day we were flying back from a mission and we ran out of gas. Now, the only place that we could... Uh, Dinner get is served, Mr. Oh, oh, let's eat, shall we? <laughs> Gosh, I'm starved. Dan, about the wedding... And I'll finish the story at dinner, and after that, I've got about a dozen others, if I can make them up, uh, uh, if I, uh, I can think of them, like the one about our chaplain. <laughs> Boy, that'll be really kill you, Mr. Man. It seems that... Uh... Well, Dan, uh, in the living room, Mrs. Meglin, with Porky. Good. The rest of us will go out on a terrace. You can have him all to yourself. Oh, just one thing, darling. I'd like to give you your trousseau as a wedding present. Oh, but Mrs. Maggie... Hush now. I insist. Oh, I just don't know how to thank you. I didn't think it was possible to be this happy. You know, I think every girl wants to wait well, for her ideal, but sometimes she gets frightened that she won't find him, so she marries the first man who comes along and tries to be contented. But it isn't contentment we dream about it love and being loved. And I realized that Dan's last thought was of me. But no girl has ever been sure that she was loved that much. I'll never be sorry that he loved me. Never, I promise that. You're such a nice girl, Peggy. Now don't waste another time and second talking to me. You run along with that. Oh, Peggy, oh, sure, sure. Porky and I were just running over some old tricks. Where are the others? Out on the terrace. Well, I guess we're all alone then, huh? <laughs> they wanted us to be. Dan, you're worried about something. For me? Oh, please don't worry about it. I really don't care anything about a big wedding. Well, that's fine, but <laughs> I, I... You know what I've been doing? No. 
Uh, ever since the word came about you and what you said just before you crashed, I've been going over and over what I'd say to you the first time we were alone. <laughs> we're really sort of strangers, aren't we? Yes. Yes, we are. I used to sit at my desk and look at you and... Well, you seem to be the prince on the white horse that every woman dreams about. Really? Well, you should have told me. I never had the chance. You always seemed so... Pardon me, please. Yes? yes? A gentleman on the phone for Miss Martin. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Albert Bigell. He says his account's receivable. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, you can take the call in the library. I'll be right back, Dan. Uh, take your time. Come here. Come here. Yeah. Fine friend you turned out to be. You see what they got cooked up for me? A marriage, that's all. And it's all your fault. Now look at me. You and I are going to have a very serious discussion right now. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Begill? Good evening, Miss Martin. I'm here at the office trying to bring your work up to date, but I can't find the Johnson account. Oh, well, whenever I've checked an account, Mr. Begill, I always put a paper clip on it. It's my code. Paper clip? But I can't find Johnson in the file anywhere. I've gone through all the J's twice. So it's under the P. For Johnson? No, for paper clip. Oh. Well, don't you see how simple it is? Yes, I see. Uh... Miss Martin, I must congratulate you for your good fortune. Well, thank you, Mr. Begill. And I might as well tell you, I asked you out twice and you refused. I pretended to be casual about your refusal, but I was much fonder of you than you realized. Well, well Mr. Begill, I, I had no idea you felt that way about me. Yes, I, I selected you as the object of my serious intentions. While I will not admit the best man won, still I extend to you my congratulations. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Miguel. Well, good night. We've got to find a way out of this, Piggy. Understand? We don't want to hurt the lady's feelings. We're not getting married, you hear? Get this. Your name is not Piggy anymore, and it isn't Peggy. That's the lady's name. It's Porky. So remember that, or you'll be having a woman boss you around instead of me. Sorry to have been so long, Dan. Everything all right? Oh, yes, everything's fine. Do you think Piggy should go for a walk? Oh, no, no, no. She's, uh... Did you say Piggy? I just heard you talking to her. Oh. I'm sorry. Oh, it's not your fault. If I'd only used my head, I'd have known it wasn't true. You never gave me any indication of being in love with me. I, I was carried away, I guess. What woman wouldn't be when a man was dying with her name on his lips? Well, I wanted to tell you right away, but everybody was making such a big thing of it. Last night I spoke on the radio. They called me your fiancé and I made a newsreel. When the word came in that you were still alive, I fainted. <laughs> it's a very comical situation, isn't it? Yeah, except nobody's laughing. And those people all over the country who went to church and prayed for us and lighted candles for us. Yeah. Well, they mustn't find out. How are you going to stop them? By keeping this up for the next two weeks. Huh? Until you leave. Look, Dan, in six months, no one will even remember our names. Well, I, I sort of had other plans. Do you want to tell the world that they've been weeping over us for nothing? That it was all because my name was mixed up with your dog's name? No, I guess not. We could pretend for two weeks, couldn't we? Sure, we could. Okay. I hadn't expected to get married anyway before all this happened. Oh, that guy on the phone? Hmm? The, the, oh, oh, yes, yes. Well, well, I'll see him first thing in the morning and explain everything. No, 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 no. Now, don't you give it another thought. Well, he must be quite a bit upset about all this. You better let me see him in square things. No, no, up. please. But I'd be glad to do it. No. What was his name again? No, believe me, it's absolutely unnecessary. Good night. Wait a minute, please. I... Good night. <laughs> The curtain falls on Act One of Practically Yours, starring Claudette Colbert and Ray Milan. We'll take time out for a brief intermission and a chat with Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. What's new about the stars, Libby? Why, Mr. Cromwell, <clears throat> Betty Hutton's news right now. I spent a day over at Paramount not long ago watching her make her latest picture, Incendiary Blonde. Quite a day it was, too. 
Well, I got all, all out of breath just watching her. <laughs> She's a lively girl, all right. Yes, she pranced through seven dance routines, rehearsed four songs, and sizzled through a love scene with Arturo de Cordova. What a Texas garden she'll make. With Betty's blonde hair and sparkling personality, she's a natural for the role of the famous nightclub queen. That she is, Mr. Kennedy. Yet with all her bounce and liveliness, she's very feminine, too. She has lovely, soft, smooth skin, and she believes in taking care of it. Aha, uh -huh, Libby. Here's where I'm going to ask you to give our audience Betty Hutton's tip on complexion care. <laughs> oh, you're doing that, Mr. Kennedy, because you know she's a luxe girl, like nine out of ten other top Hollywood stars. Well, I can tell you she's very serious about her Lux Soap beauty care. Don't you think the women in our audience would like to know how Betty Hutton takes her daily active lather facials? Go right ahead, Libby. Well, here's what she says. I cover my face with Lux Soap's creamy lather and work it in thoroughly. Then I rinse with warm water, splash on cold, and pat my face dry with a soft towel. I find skin becomes lovelier so quickly with Lux Soap care. It's a real beauty soap. It's true that regular facials with Lux Toilet Soap really make skin lovelier. Recent tests proved it, showed that actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time with this gentle daily care. Why don't you try it? You'll like the extra creamy lather, the way it leaves skin softer, smoother. And when you see those Technicolor close-ups of Betty in Incendiary Blonde, Remember what she says. Lux Soap Complexion Care really works. It's Hollywood's way to beauty. Here's our guest producer, Mr. John Cromwell. We bring you Act Two of Practically Yours, starring Claudette Colbert as Peggy and Ray Milland as Lieutenant Bellamy. <laughs> it's an hour later. Peggy Martin has dried some bitter tears and dropped off to sleep. But in another guest room, Lieutenant Bellamy and his little dog, Piggy, are still very much awake. Now cut it out. Stop kissing me and get under the covers. See the jam you've gotten me into? I gotta do something about that girl. I gotta square things with her boyfriend. Now, what name did the butler say when he phoned? George? Art? No. Albert? Yeah, Albert. Albert, that's right. That comes receivable. What was his last name? Fox. Albert Fox. Yeah. Lion. Rabbit. Wolf. <coughs> Wolf, yeah, probably is. No, no, it was some other kind, some kind of a dog. Beagle. Bigel, yeah, Albert Bigel, accounts receivable. That's it. I've got to get to him first thing in the morning. Remember that, first thing in the morning. It's a surprise. I told you, Peggy, a surprise. Now hurry up. Hurry up where? What surprise? Right in there, the library. I want to finish my breakfast. Besides, after last night, I'm not especially crazy about your surprise. Now, just you trust me, will I'm you? not crazy about trusting you, either. Look, what do you want most in this world? To go back and finish my coffee. Well, wait till you see what I've got in here. <laughs> see? There he is. Oh, no. What's the matter with you? It's Albert. Good morning, Peggy. Peggy? Say good morning to Albert. Good morning. He phoned me, Peggy. He said to come right down here. Albert, last night Peggy told me all about you two, and I understand I've broken up a beautiful romance. Why, no, not at all. Miss Martin and I are mere friends. Not even bosom friends. Mm. Now, don't you worry, Albert. I'm going to fix everything. But you don't understand why, why I've known about you and Miss Martin for some time. Your uh, relationship. Our relationship. May I say something? Please, please do. Dan, I'd like to talk to Albert. Of course. Alone. Oh. If you'll just step out in the hall. How's this? Thank you. Albert. Huh? Albert, you know very well I never mentioned Dan to you. Not once. Why, well, no, but I thought it would be nice if he thought that you... What's the matter? Do you recall what you said to me last night on the phone? Well, I... I guess so. Well, do you still feel the same way about me? Well, yes, but... Uh... Then listen... You remember what Dan said that day when his plane was diving for that Japanese carrier? He wanted to kiss the end of your nose. Yes, except he said Piggy, not Peggy. Albert, do you know who Piggy is? So now that everybody's got mixed up and that's how I've made it... No, so that's how everybody got mixed up and that's how I've made such a fool of myself. And now you're the only other person who knows. 
Mr. and Mrs. Meglin think everything's just wonderful. A dog. All the time he meant a dog. Albert, I've just told you. You ready for me yet? Come in. I've told Albert everything. Oh. Well, I'll be out of here in a couple of weeks, so you have nothing to worry about, Beagle. Uh, Bigel. Two L's. Sorry. Guess it's just that I'm fond of dogs, huh? Well, the point is, we've got to keep this thing strictly between ourselves, understand? You see, Albert, millions of people are expecting Dan and me to be happily in love. But this seems to, be, seems to be in the nature of a hoax, a deception. Exactly, but the morale of the whole nation is liable to suffer if we all don't do our part. That's true. And it's all set. For two weeks, Peggy is my girl. And after that, you two are off to the races again. Be careful, Mr. Meglin's coming. Hey, what's going on out here? Oh, Mr. Meglin, uh, may I present my oldest and dearest friend, Mr. Albert Beagle? I took the liberty of asking him over for a few minutes. Oh, how do you do, sir? I'm accounts receivable. Oh. Hmm. Uh, now, Peggy, uh, this show you're going to... <coughs> oh, uh, are you going downtown now, Mr. Beagle? Uh, oh, yes, sir. Well, come on, then. They want to get rid of us. Oh. They want to walk in the park. He wants to kiss around the nose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can hardly wait. A very nice fellow, that Albert. Do you mind if I finish my breakfast now? Oh, no, no, not at all. And then, since everybody's expecting it, we'd better take that walk in the park. Now, wait a minute. Well, what else we got to do? Well, I guess if we're going to be seen together for two weeks, maybe we should find out something about each other. Sure. But please, no more surprises, hmm? Yes, sir, that Albert's all right, sharp as a tack. Yeah, he may not be good-looking, but I think it's easier to hold on to a man if he isn't too handsome. Exactly. I know if I were a girl, he'd be just the kind of fella I'd want to marry. You are going to marry him. Well, there's nothing really definite. Oh, there isn't, huh? Well, you know, it wouldn't be too bad if people found out about us. Oh, I know. So I think we ought to leave Albert out of these dates you're going to have. It'd be a lot better. Better for whom? Do you know that the girls on the fourth floor held an election once? And guess who won? Who? You. They elected you the wolf most likely to succeed. Oh. <laughs> Dead, huh? Mm-hmm. It wasn't even close. The runner-up only got three votes. How many girls on the floor? 120. Hmm. What three did I miss, I wonder? Well, I forget who the other two were. Oh, gosh, I just remembered something. Look, I, uh... I've got a land I ought to go and see. I used to spend hours down in the South Pacific thinking of the wonderful sponge cake she makes. Of course, I wouldn't want to impose my relatives on you, so... No, uh... look, Dan. This is your leave, and you've certainly earned it. You go right ahead and get some of that wonderful sponge cake. All right, well, uh, what are you going to do later on, say, around 3 o'clock? Well, I'm going to the Newsreel Theater on 57th Street. I want to see myself on the screen. Okay, Newsreel Theater, 3 o'clock. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. And oh, oh, say, I uh, may be a little late. I've got a couple of ants I want to see. Oh, I'm sure you have. Maybe you'd like to bring them along. Goodbye. Say, we timed it just right, huh? Mm -hmm. Intermission. Those seats okay? Oh, fine. Say, what happened to your nose? Hmm? Your nose, it's swollen. Oh, then. Oh, I can guess. Your Aunt Sponge Cake's married now, and her husband socked you, huh? No husband socked me. When this girl saw me, she threw her arms around me and started to cry. So I kissed her, naturally. And because I kissed her, she called me a beast. She said that was a fine way to treat you. And she hit me on the nose. She wears costume jewelry. Oh, what a shame. How'd you make out with your other aunt? Well, she works at a war plant. I won't be able to see her until about 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, that's rather inconvenient. Well, I've been in the South Pacific for a year and a half. Nothing is inconvenient. Well, tell me about it later. Here's our newsreel. The Atlas News. Headline. Actual scenes of our great hero, Lieutenant Bellamy, seeking the Japanese aircraft carrier. These pictures were made by a naval patrol near the spot at the time of Bellamy's amazing accomplishment. Watch this brave, this daring young American send his plane plummeting toward the enemy ship. Ah, boy. As fast as the flight of sound, he streaks downward, meaning to sacrifice his young life to destroy that Jap carrier. Oh, for the love of Mike. Hey, you! Fight down! And here you see the death blow. The indomitable courage of a great hero destroys the giant of the sea. And there it goes. Ah, push one. Hey, listen, you. Why ain't you over there? And here is our hero's sweetheart, Peggy Martin, 
receiving the news that he is alive. That's me. Oh, no, I can't look like that. Suddenly she faints, overcome by the news that gave her back the man she loved. And here, here is Lieutenant Bellamy's arrival in New York City. Look at his face. Look at those shining eyes, that determined mouth, that heroic jaw. That stupid expression. You've got a stronger stomach than I have. Excuse me, Peggy, I gotta leave. Oh, no. You ain't leave. Now, just a second, mister. You've been making remarks, see? About a great guy, Well, see? I'm sorry, sir. Oh, I'm shut sorry. up. Got a uniform on, huh? Wait till you rent it. Look, I'm trying to get out of here. Yella, huh? Why, you Times Square commando. Oh, my nose. Oh. <laughs> How does your nose feel now? Well, it stopped bleeding. Big lug. If I hadn't been in uniform, but... Well, we can slow down now. Oh. And I think that man acted very patriotically. The theater was dark. He didn't know you were Lieutenant Bellamy. That was me on the screen, see? And if I want to give myself the bird, I can't. But you're not you anymore. You're Dick Tracy. You're Superman. You're, you're Dan Bellamy. And I'm getting awful sick of it. Oh, pardon me, please. Aren't you Lieutenant Bellamy? Huh? Oh, I hate to impose upon you, but... Oh, you must be Miss Martin. Yes. <laughs> you don't know me. I'm Helen Macy. You see, my husband's also a pilot on an aircraft carrier. The Lincoln. Lincoln? I just wondered. I thought you might know him. George Macy? Well, I... I've met quite a few of the fellows from the Lincoln, yeah. Why, Danny, you must be the Macy you were telling me about. You were saying what a wonderful flyer he is. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, of course. George Macy, yeah. <sighs> Tony, when you saw him last, how was he? Oh, he was fine, just fine. Please, what else? It doesn't have to be anything important. Well, he's uh, he's very popular with the other pilots. He is? Yes, indeed. I, I remember he was uh, he was captain of the squadron volleyball team. <laughs> His last letter seemed to indicate he'd be coming home soon. Well, I, I wouldn't know about that. Couldn't you find out then? Oh, no. No, he can't. Besides, I know George. He'd much rather surprise me. Well, I hope he comes back soon, Mrs. Macy, but don't be too disappointed if it's a while yet. He's on a very dangerous job. They all are. Oh, he'll come back. Oh, I know he will. I'm sure he will. That's my apartment just across the street. Would you care to come up? Just for tea, perhaps? Well, thanks very much, but we'll really have to be going. <laughs> of course. You've both been very kind to give me this much of your precious time together. Well, goodbye, Lieutenant. Goodbye, Miss Martin. Goodbye. Dan. What? Why didn't you want to talk to her? I didn't know her husband. I had to make up something. Well, you're so good at making up stories. Why didn't you make up something good instead of telling her about it being dangerous? The Lincoln was sunk three weeks ago. What? Most of her planes were lost. The fellow I know is a good friend of Macy's. Macy's dead. They'll be announcing it any day now. Oh. oh. Come on. Get a taxi and go back to the Meglins. We've got a big night ahead of us. You and I and Albert. I better warn you, though, my tango's pretty rusty. Goodness, this has been quite an evening, hasn't it? I should say so. Dinner in that very expensive place, the Follies, and now our third nightclub. How about a dance, Peggy? Would you mind, Albert? Right ahead. I'll just study the prices on the menu. Albert, <laughs> that's my hand you're holding under the table. I'm afraid you'll have to let go now. Oh. Oh, I beg your pardon. Thanks, old man. We won't be long. that Albert's a prince, a wonderful, wonderful fellow. Yes. Except he's bashful. So I've decided I'm going to do something nice for him. I'm going to get Albert to propose to you. Would you mind doing something nice for me? What? Move back. Your buttons are rather lumpy. Okay, but that's the whole idea. Getting Albert jealous. Before the night's over, he's going to want to fight me. Then you got him. You're not used to champagne, are you? Don't interrupt the professor. We are going to give Albert the needle. Albert is a potential husband. He needs needling. Hence, we must get closer. Oh, Dan, now stop it. Stop what? Stop holding me so close. Closely. Closely. Uh, very well, very well, very well. Then we'll proceed to the second part of the lesson, which has to do with a change of pace. Mm -hmm. Change of pace is the secret of the true needler. It consists of dancing close. Uh, I mean, closely. 
when the gentleman doesn't expect it, and unclosely when the gentleman wants to snuggle. He says yes, you say no. He says no, you say yes. <laughs> That's the whole thing in a nutshell. But do you think you can remember all that? I haven't heard a word you said. Okay, let's just dance, huh? Fine. Hey, aren't you getting awful close? You're not trying to pull that stuff on me, are you? Hmm? I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Well, Albert, here we are again. Peggy doesn't want to dance anymore. Peggy? Yes, Albert? I've been watching. Has this man been offensive to you? Well, certainly not. Why, Albert? I'm not talking to you. If he's been bothering you, Peggy, I'll thrash him within an inch of his life. Oh, I'm sure you would, Albert, but there's no need for that. Oh, I know all about you, Lieutenant Daniel Bellamy. You, you wolf most likely to succeed. Albert, that election wasn't unanimous. See what I mean, Peggy? Look, I'd like to go home. I had a wonderful time, but now I'd like to go home. Good, good. Let's go home, shall we? Well, we can't stand here on the doorstep. Won't you come in, Albert? I'm sure the Meglins won't mind much. I prefer to stay out here. Peggy, there's something I want to discuss with you. Peggy, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? Are you asking me? Of course not. Then stop looking at me and look at Peggy. Albert, I don't know what to say. It's all so unexpected. Well, I'm a man who makes quick decisions. That's the reason I'm assistant manager of accounts receivable. Oh, she's just being coy, Albert. I am not being coy. Well, then why don't you give him a nice big kiss and tell him you'll be glad to marry him? Will you please let me conduct my affairs in my own way? Okay. But from where I sit, you look like a woman that doesn't even want to be near dear Albert. Does she, Albert? Well, in view of what you said, she said, and in view of what she just said... Albert. Yes? Albert, uh, I would like very much to kiss you. Oh. There. Oh, Peggy. I, I'm the happiest man in the world. <laughs> good night, Peggy. Get a good night's sleep, and I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh! Uh, I uh, guess I fell down the steps. Good night. Good night, old man. Now, if you don't mind getting out the keys, I think I'd like to go inside. Well, you saw how simple it was when you followed my advice. Thanks, Professor. Look, uh, well, frankly, the professor's just a little bit befuddled. No. Well, it seemed to me that kiss you gave Albert was just a little bit overdone. It was? Yeah. I just want to be sure that you're still not getting me mixed up with that prince on the white horse. Oh, there's absolutely no connection, I assure you. Well, it's almost two o'clock. Class is waiting. Huh? Well, your other student, just for a bite of sponge cake, remember? Good night, Professor. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a minute, we will bring you the third act of Practically Yours, starring Claudette Colbert and Ray Milland. As a director, I am continually asked, where do the new young picture stars come from? Every studio in Hollywood is anxious to discover fresh talent. As an example, meet one of Paramount's new starlets, brown-eyed, honey-blonde Virginia Wells. Tell us, Virginia, how did you get into the movies? Mostly luck, Mr. Cromwell. While I was at high school in Wisconsin, my sister got married in Los Angeles. Mother and I came out to the wedding. Naturally, we wanted to see the sights, and one night we went to the prize fights at the Legion Stadium. Ah, a sports fan, eh? Well, not exactly. We heard that all the movie stars went there on Friday evenings. Coming out, a talent scout asked me if I'd come to the studio the next morning for an interview with the casting director. <laughs> Pretty excited, weren't you? We hardly dared believe it. But next day, Paramount offered me a screen test. And now you're one of their featured players. Uh, what pictures are you making, Virginia? I recently finished Kiss and Tell on Loan Out to Columbia, and now I'm working in my first for Paramount, To Each His Own, starring John Lund and Olivia de Havilland. It's very modest of you to call it luck, Virginia, but we're not quite so modest. I imagine Mr. Kennedy has a, here has a different opinion. How about it, John? Talent and personality had lots to do with <coughs> it, of course, 
But we're pretty proud of the fact that Virginia Wells is a Lux girl. Didn't you find a lovely Lux complexion quite a help in that screen test, Virginia? Well, you might say so, Mr. Kennedy. Anyway, I do know that Lux toilet soap helps my complexion to be at its best all the time. I really depend on my daily act of lather facials. They're so quick and easy, and they really work. Camera close-ups will never hold any terrors for you, Miss Virginia Wells. Thank you, and best of luck from all of us. Thank you, Mr. Cromwell. I'm sure millions of women listening will agree that Lux Toilet Soap is a complexion care they can depend on. Out here in Hollywood, the vote is just about unanimous. Nine out of ten lovely screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap every day because they find the rich, super creamy lather gives precious complexions just the gentle, protecting care they need. Why don't you try it? Get some fine white Lux Toilet Soap, Hollywood's own beauty soap, tomorrow. We return to Mr. Cromwell and our stars. Act three of Practically Yours, starring Claudette Colbert as Peggy and Ray Milland as Lieutenant Bellamy. It's the following morning. Peggy, Commander Harper, and the Meglins are halfway through breakfast. But there's no sign at all of Lieutenant Bellamy. Nervously, Peggy tries to lead the conversation away from America's number one hero. But the job is hopeless. Peggy, dear, you knocked at Dan's door, didn't you? No, no, I didn't. Oh? You see, he said something about wanting to see his aunt this morning, very early this morning. Well, I'll bet he's still asleep after that big night out. Oh, Dan wouldn't want to waste his time sleeping. I'll, I'll go see. No, I know. He's probably taking Piggy for a walk. Piggy? Who's Piggy? Oh, no, I mean Porky, of course. Porky. <laughs> yeah, Porky's out on the terrace. See? Oh, yes. uh, Peggy, uh, do you know where Dan went after you two came home last night? I'm not sure, but I can guess. Mm, I was still awake. Murder mystery. I heard him go out, and when he came back, he told me all about her. He what? You've no idea how devoted he is to her. Imagine walking his dog in the park at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you mean he, he just walked the dog? Are you sure? Well, of course I'm sure. And when they got back, we all had a little nightcap. <laughs> Porky loves beer. <laughs> oh, well, maybe we'd better wake him up after all. Wake who up? Well, oh, good, good morning, morning. Lieutenant. Morning. Here's some nice hot coffee, Dan. Well, now that we're all together, let's talk about the wedding. Someone you know getting married? Oh, someone we know is getting married. Uh, Dan, we'd just better forget about having a big affair. Uh, time's so short, you know. Uh, let's have the wedding tomorrow night. Huh? <laughs> Something wrong, Dan? Just swallowed my future, wrong throat. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Dan, oh. uh, my brother is coming down today. He's a Supreme Court judge. Oh, he'd love to marry you. It's going to be a very busy day. Tell him about it, Commander. Well, Dan, it's now 9 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, the Navy would like you two at the City Hall to sell war bonds. Well, that we don't mind, do we? I should say not. At 2.30, <clears throat> the Red Cross wants you at Armand Lacrosse. He's that famous photographer, Dan. Oh. Uh, they'd like you and Peggy to pose for a Red Cross poster. Okay? Sure, sure. At 5 o'clock at the Brooklyn Navy Yard is the launching of a new ship, the William S. Holton. They're going to broadcast it, and we thought it'd be nice if Peggy swings a bottle of champagne, and you'd say a few words. Oh. You see, Robert, that's my brother, he's the judge. Robert's going to talk the launching, too. Then we can all go to dinner and arrange everything for the wedding tomorrow. Well, that's just fine, Mrs. Meglin, except that Peggy doesn't think we should get married. Uh, what? what? What do you What's mean? What? What you... Well, that is not yet. Oh. Peggy. Oh, uh, well, I, I fear we've got to be practical. You know, the war and everything. And, and then there's Dan's folks in, in Iowa, and they want us to get married there. Oh, yes, yes. And then there's my mother in Boston. She said... Oh, I can see I... Peggy's side of it, all right. After all, I'll be going right back to the South Pacific. So maybe we'd just better keep thinking about it for a few days. Oh, dear. Well, whatever you children wish. Well, you still help us sell those war bonds, though. Oh, yes. Yeah. Then let's hurry up and get downtown. <laughs> Commander, how'd we do? Terrific. You two sold over $90,000 worth of bonds. Well, here's the restaurant. I'd say you've earned your lunch. Aren't you eating with us, sir? Can't. The skipper sent for me. It's about the Lincoln. You heard about losing her, Dan. Yeah. I was on New Georgia when she went down. Any friends aboard? A couple. Sorry, Dan. 
Well, they're just releasing the news. It'll be in the evening papers. Well, I'll see you. Five o'clock at the Navy Yard. Goodbye. What's the matter with you? I'm thinking of her, Helen Macy. Her husband was on the Lincoln. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, it just isn't right for her to get the news like that. Read it in the newspaper. She won't hear it that way. She's probably had a telegram by now. A telegram alone in that apartment? Yeah, it's tough. Oh, say, I almost forgot. I've got a date with Miss Sponge Cake. You, uh, you wouldn't mind if I beat it, would you? No lunch? No, I think I'll just skip it. Well, don't forget about the photographer, though. 2.30. I'll be there. Sorry to run out. Oh, sure. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Macy. Do you remember me? Miss Martin. Please, won't you come in? I heard about the Lincoln. I wanted to see you, if only for a moment. The telegram came this morning. I... I just can't believe it. Well, how do you feel? Better? I... Well, I'm fine, thank you. Lieutenant Bellamy said you had a splitting headache and he wouldn't let you come. Has Dan been here? He left just a few minutes ago. He tries so hard not to show his feelings, doesn't he? He's the gentlest person I've ever met. Yes. Oh, can't I do something, Mrs. Macy? I, I so want to help you if I can. There's nothing anyone can do. I knew all along I might lose. It was just when the bell rang and I found the telegram. Forgive me, please. Don't be sorry for me, and don't let this influence you and Dan. You do love him, don't you? I love him more than I ever thought I could love anyone. Then marry him right away. My only regret is that before I was married, there were two or three weeks when I was trying to make up my mind. Well, I think I'd like a cup of tea. You'll have some with me, Peggy? Thank you. I'd like to very much. Well, Mr. Lacrosse, Lieutenant Bellamy's here in the reception room. Uh, then if you are ready, Miss Martin, we can take the photograph. Send the subject in, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Lacrosse, you won't let him suspect anything. Of course not. All morning I say to myself, Mr. Lacrosse, how should you pose the two subjects? Then you come in and give me such a brilliant idea. An embrace, a kiss. <laughs> I should have thought of it myself. <laughs> yes. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. How's Miss Sponge Cake? What? Well, you did see her. What makes you think I didn't? Nothing. Please, we get down to business. This photograph will appear on a million Red Cross posters, Lieutenant. Such a picture must have an idea behind it. And I have it. A kiss. Huh? You will pose embracing the young lady. Well, that sounds very simple. Do you want me with the cap on or the cap off? So, you think it is so simple, Lieutenant? Let me tell you. Once I was paid $10,000 to make raspberries more popular. It was a picture of a single raspberry. It took me one month. But what a picture, what a raspberry. Mm, did people buy more raspberries? How do I know? After Michelangelo finished the Sistine Chapel, did he hang around counting the attendance? Hm. All right now, all right. Pause. Pause. Ah, fooey. What's the matter? Lieutenant, kissing a beautiful woman is different from sinking a ship. Please, shall we try it again? I'm sorry, Dan. Oh, well. You must be out of practice. Look, I've kissed girls before, never had any complaints. Well, then what's the matter with you? Why don't you relax? All right. Tell me what's wrong with this. <clears throat> well, any better? Lieutenant, let us think of it this way. Oh, no. Oh, please be patient, Dan. Let us think that this is the girl you you want her, you need her. Do not fight it, Lieutenant. Hold her tighter. Kiss her, kiss her, kiss her. Okay. 
That's it, that's it, wonderful. Oh, that's enough, Lieutenant, enough, Lieutenant. Oh, I'm exhausted. Water, I need uh, water. I guess we can go now, Dan. Wait a minute, maybe we'll need another shot. I really don't think so. Well, I think maybe we ought to a different angle, you see, something like this. No, well, oh, that's well. Your... <clears throat> well, I don't mean to interrupt, but... Albert, how nice to see you. What do you want? I have something to show you. Though I really shouldn't be here. I should be at my post of duty in accounts receivable. Then why aren't you? Because this is very, very important. A surprise? An extra special surprise for you. Well, how'd you know we'd be here? Well, I phoned him, Dan. I promised him last night I would. Hurry, please. Uh. I have a taxi outside and the meter's ticking. Coming. Albert wants to get married right away as soon as you leave. Right away? But how would that look? I mean, for you. Do you think we should wait? Why, certainly I think we should wait. Now, what's the surprise he's got? I haven't the slightest idea, honestly, Dan. Well, we'd better go with him. But I have a feeling I'm not going to like this at all. Albert, what are we doing in this apartment house? Now, now, don't be impatient. I promised you both a surprise, and here it is. See? Apartment number 1010. My lucky number. I open the door, and what do you see? I see that this is where somebody lives. Exactly. The future residence of Mr. and Mrs. Albert W. Bigell. How do you like it, Peggy? It's, it's very nice. Completely furnished in every detail. Picture me in this easy chair. Peggy is in the kitchen doing the dinner dishes. She's finished the dishes, brings me my slippers, and sits at my feet. She's reading to me. Some worthwhile book. Ah, uh, exciting, isn't it? Do you light your pipe all by yourself? I don't smoke. Oh. Now here, here is the kitchen. Perhaps we'll have breakfast in here. Glass of hot water, not too hot, and half a lemon. A's digestion. You must get the hot water habit too, Peggy. Whole wheat toast and stewed prunes. I think I owe my pleasant disposition to stewed prunes as much as anything. Also that deep expression on your face, Albert. Yes, and now, down this little hall and... Our room. Our own little room. How do you like it? Albert, I hope you haven't paid for any of this yet. I mean, if it had to be sent back, you, you wouldn't want to lose anything. You think it's more than we could afford? <laughs> Albert, are you feeling well? <laughs> this apartment. <laughs> the employees had a meeting and voted it as a present to Lieutenant Bellamy. All furnished and a year's rent paid up. Mm, well, this will come as a blow to you, Albert. I can't accept a gift like this, not in uniform. That's the joke. So they decided to give the apartment to Peggy. Just to Peggy. I don't think I'm entitled to it morally. You're not accepting it morally, just legally. And if Peggy Martin changes her mind about marrying a certain lieutenant and marries a certain somebody else, there's nothing they can do about it. How's that for being practical, Lieutenant? It's a little too practical. I don't like it. I think I'm entitled to a little compensation for my part in this masquerade. Peggy, I've got to get out of here. I had an idea you'd start running. Albert, look at me. Yes. Oh! <clears throat> Count to ten. That's his lucky number. But he's unconscious. Peggy, I know when I'm licked. I love you. But I'm not going to be carrying a torch all over the South Pacific. It's hot enough. We're going to get married. Is this a proposal? Yeah. Oh. Okay. We'll get married right away. No. No, not right away. When the war's over. When the war's over? But that may be a long time. Peggy, you've got to be sensible about this thing. Oh, I don't want to be sensible. If, if I were sensible, I, I'd marry him. Oh, don't be silly. You, you couldn't marry that totem pole with that cackle and hot water and lemon juice and... Oh. Oh, hello, Albert. Oh. <coughs> Marrying a man with no vices? How do you know he'd even kiss you goodnight? I bet he's not even... I bet he's even got something against that. It's not sanitary or something. Will you marry me when I get back? I want to get married now. Look, Peggy, I love you. I'm not going to have you sitting alone back here like Helen Macy, with your heart in your throat every time the doorbell rings. Oh, but you're wrong, Dan. She told me the one thing she regrets is that she lost two weeks making up her mind before she married him. I'm asking you to wait till I come back. Yes or no? No. Okay, then. Goodbye. Where are you going? To launch a battleship. He loves me. He loves me. Mrs. May? 
Maglin! Mrs. Maglin! Mrs. Oh. <laughs> how do you do? Oh, how do you do? Oh, you must be Judge Simpson, Mrs. Maglin's brother. And you must be Miss Martin. Certainly going to be pleasant launching with you, Miss Martin. <laughs> Isn't it about time we left? The Maglins haven't gone, have Oh, they? no, they'll be home any minute. We can all drive out to the Navy Yard together. Well, so you're the young lady who's reluctant to marry the young lieutenant. Oh, look, I'm getting tired of taking all this blame. I'm not reluctant. He is. He wants to wait until after the war. Right this minute, he's probably out somewhere not getting married. Oh? Well, that seems odd. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not making sense, am I? I'm just so afraid I'm going to lose him, the stubborn idiot. Well, we ought to be able to do something about that. I doubt it. I've tried everything I know. Would you like some assistance, Miss Martin? You mean you know We'll it? see, Miss Martin. Hmm? We'll see. Uh, you're sure you love him? Oh, yes. Yes. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Well, Lieutenant Bellamy, you finally decided to show up. Get out of my way, Albert. Mr. Meglin told me to look for you. Everybody's looking for you. They have some stupid idea they can't launch the boat without you. Look, you found me, now beat it. Oh, I'm afraid I can't do that. After the ceremonies, I'm escorting my intended home. If you're here after the ceremonies, I'll launch you, too. Don't you dare touch me. Besides, we're not speaking. There's very little more I can say, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be present at the launching of this addition to our fleet. May it prove worthy of our Navy's proud tradition. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Bellamy. Miss Peggy Martin is here, too, ladies and gentlemen. In just a moment, she'll christen our new ship with a traditional bottle of champagne. Right now, a word from the celebrated jurist, Judge Robert Simpson. I, uh, I had a prepared speech for this occasion, folks. I just looked it over, and it's probably the dullest thing you ever listened to. <laughs> so I tore it up. Instead, I figured you'd all be much more interested in a little backstage gossip concerning Lieutenant Bellamy and Peggy Martin. Well, it seems the lieutenant has been coaxing Miss Martin to marry him, but without success. Hey, now, wait a minute, lieutenant. We're on the air. Well, don't tell him. Tell... Sir? Lieutenant, they gave you your chance to talk. Now it's mine. <laughs> <clears throat> As I was saying, Miss Martin, on the other hand, has insisted upon waiting till the war is over. So let's hear her side of the case. Judge, I've changed my mind. Dan, darling, since you're so determined to get married now, I, well, I just haven't got the heart to refuse you. Hey, uh, the lieutenant is too overcome to speak, and I'm not going to give Miss Martin a chance to change her mind. I'll perform the ceremony right here and now. But, Judge, in ten seconds, this ship's sliding down the waist. Now, wait a minute. I protest. This looks like collusion and chicanery. Who is this person? I'll tell you who I am. It's high time the public knew that... There goes the ship. Christen it, Peggy. Christen it. The champagne. Here, here. I insist on being heard. I christen me the USS William. Hey, you christened oh. Albert. Albert, christen the ship. Hurry up. I christen me William S. Holton. <laughs> <laughs> By virtue of the powers in me vested in touch of the Supreme Court. Dan. Uh-huh. In just two minutes, we'll have been married exactly three hours. Yeah. See, I can't get over it. And those kids in the office giving us this apartment. Do you like it too, Piggy, do you? <laughs> <laughs> All furnished and everything. Hey. Hey, it just dawned on me. We've got nothing to eat. Look, I'll just have time to run down to the delicatessen and then I... I hey, come on, Pete. No, no, no. This little piggy does not go to market. No, you either. Well, we can't starve. Dan, look in the kitchen. Well, what do you know? Sponge cake. <laughs> Back to the footlights for their curtain call come Claudette Colbert and Ray Milan, who made our first night so enjoyable e an evening to remember. Thank you, John. It's good to have had a part in opening this theater for another season. And you two were certainly the ones to do it. Together, you represent 26 appearances in this theater. 
And we're looking forward to many more, John. How does the season look from this point? Well, we've spent a busy summer lining up plays and stars. I think the effort will be more than justified by what we'll have to offer in the coming weeks. What pictures have you been reviewing <coughs> for Lux? One that we all enjoyed seeing was Ray's latest picture for Paramount, Lost Weekend. And I can honestly say, Ray, I think you give the finest performance of your career. Thanks, John. Thank you. But uh, while you're passing around compliments, be sure and save plenty for Claudette and her latest picture, Guest Wife. Well, it's easy to find compliments for Claudette and for that lovely complexion. I know what you're getting at, John. And it's true that I've been taking care of my complexion. I've been faithful to Lux Toilet Soap all the time Lux has been off the air. What are you presenting on this stage next Monday night, John? Well, tonight we've seen the humorous side of what can happen to returning heroes. Next week, we present an altogether different version in a picture which I had the privilege of directing for RKO. It's based on what I believe to be one of the greatest love stories to come out of any war, Arthur Pinero's The Enchanted Cottage. It's a splendid play, John. Do you have the original star from the picture? Yes, we have Robert Young as the returning soldier crushed by the scars and shock of battle, and Dorothy McGuire as the girl whose sympathy and compassion cloaks them both in a love that overcomes all handicaps. Well, it's not only a great play, John, but with millions of our own men coming back, it's an important and a timely one. We'll be listening, John. Good night. Good night. Good night, and thank you both for giving us such a splendid start on our new season. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening and the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Young and Dorothy McGuire in The Enchanted Cottage. This is John Cromwell saying goodnight to you from Hollywood.